At this time, all over Europe, it was fashionable to make music out of the most unlikely things. An old lampshade, an empty tin can, Anything that could make a sound could be doctored by the tape recorder. What have we got here? A box of gravel. Beautiful, beautiful. Something else? Heaven knows what this is. That makes a good noise. We need a basic rhythm, don't we? Well, how about something as mundane as a metronome? That should keep things going. What else could we use? One defunct alarm clock. Got to have possibilities in it somewhere. Now, add all these bits together on a tape recorder. Play some of them backwards, some of them forwards, some at the wrong speed. And this is what you end up with. Take one cash register, give its sound a similar treatment, and you have an ironic comment about Christmas spending. By playing around with tape, almost anything can become musical. How about the first symphony for one straw? This bizarre performance was recorded to provide the background music for an open university program about particle physics. Cutting out the gasps for air, the best bits of bubbling are selected to make a continuous loop. This loop of bubbles can now be re-recorded at various speeds. Soon there'll be enough bubble noises at different frequencies to play a tune. All these bubble frequencies are now individually transferred to a multi-track recorder before being mixed together to produce the final sound which will back the commentary voice and reinforce in musical terms the message of the program. Having carefully timed the bubble music, it can now be checked to see if it fits the pictures. Add music or effects to even the most academic animation and it suddenly comes very much to life. Armed with a tape recorder or two, the creative soloist can turn himself into an orchestra. This first machine is recording, while a second replays that recording a few moments later for it to be re-recorded by the first recorder. Paddy Kingsland explains. I'll show you how it works. You play a note on the guitar. And the notes are repeated. And that'll go on for as long as you like. And what you have to do then is add various lines to that. And 
whole thing goes on, you can gradually add more and more sounds. Now, if you get uh, too loud, you can overload the whole system, but it's possible to get a rather big build-up. The leap from the natural to the supernatural came about because the experimenters were no longer satisfied with doctoring existing sounds. After all, why be tied to the strings of a piano when the world of electronics is full of noises of its own? Even if some are not all that easy on the ear. Now that sound is produced because whatever this microphone picks up is being fed to this loudspeaker back to this microphone, to this loudspeaker, round and round and round in a self-perpetuating shriek of energy. But if we introduce an element of control into that by only allowing the sounds of a certain pitch to go round and round and round, we've got a new possibility. It's hardly Beethoven, but it's better than it was a second or two ago. Now, this device up here is an oscillator. It works on exactly the same principle. Inside there is an electronic circuit which is producing a noise. A filter removes from that noise the pitch that we want to hear and feeds that back into the front of the circuit. Round and round it goes once again, regenerating itself all the time. Until in the end, all that comes out of here is that one pure frequency. Alter the filter, and we can alter the note that this produces. To the engineer, the oscillator is simply a test instrument. You feed that known frequency into whatever it is you're examining and see what comes out the other end. But to the experimental musician working back in the late 1950s, the discovery of the note that the oscillator could produce was like suddenly coming across one key on a piano. So they took one note on a keyboard and used that as the switch to turn the oscillator on and off. Then they found a second oscillator for that note, and a third, and a fourth, and a fifth, until they built up a collection of oscillators big enough to be the basis of supernatural music. The oscillators provide the single frequencies for the tune mixed here with white noise, a hissing sound, a blend of all frequencies, just as white light is a blend of all colors. But there are limitations to what six oscillators and one small keyboard can do. And everybody's life was made easier by the arrival on the scene of an American, Dr. Robert Moog. Dr. Moog showed that one oscillator could produce many notes. Dr. Moog's principle was called voltage control. Each time the musician hit a key or altered one of the controls on the panel, he in effect transmitted a particular voltage across that part of the circuit that he was using. It was this voltage which controlled the output of the instrument, or the synthesizer, as it had now come to be called. Musicians who had been constrained in the past by the particular sound that a piano or a violin or a saxophone could produce, found that with an instrument like this, they could produce the sound, the texture, the quality, the tone, that up to now had only been in their heads. What do I mean by that? Well, listen, here's the note E. Here's exactly the same note. And still the same note. Why the differences? Oh, it's just something to do with the tone, you may say. But armed with this equipment, we can be a lot more specific. Let's go back to that first version of the note E. And look at the display on this screen. Now this is a frequency analyzer. And here you can see that that sound of E is one single tone, one lone frequency. All sounds 
are waves. And the faster those waves fluctuate in the air, the higher the note that we can hear. So a low note, a sound, has slow fluctuations. A slightly higher note has faster fluctuations. And a really high note has exceedingly fast fluctuations. Look at that on the oscilloscope. Let's freeze one split second in time. And we can see that the waveform which produces the lone frequency is an even rolling shape, which the engineers call a sine wave. Now let's move on to our second version of E. That one. And straight away, we can see a quite different shape on the oscilloscope screen. The same number of fluctuations in that split second but a waveform with a totally different shape. That's called a square wave. And why is it different? Well, the answer lies on the frequency analyzer. Look. No longer one pure tone. There's the fundamental, certainly the main note, that's E, but all these other ones too. Are they harmonics? And a square wave includes all the odd ones, the third, the fifth, the seventh, and the ninth, gradually dying away. And then, there's our third version of the same note. There on the frequency analyzer, you can see that that one includes all the harmonics, even and odd. And over on the oscilloscope, yet another waveform. Same number of fluctuations again, but a different shape from either of the other two. And that one is called a sawtooth. Using Dr. Moog's voltage control techniques, it's now become relatively easy for the musician to get these different waveforms to interact with one another, producing combinations of harmonics and tones unknown in the world of natural music. But it's clear that anybody who plays an instrument like this and has to concentrate on both the keyboard and the control panel will very quickly run out of pairs of hands.